Okay, well, we'll get going. Thank you again, everyone, for coming to this hybrid meeting and braving things in person. It's nice to be able to have a meeting and get people together. I don't know about you, but this is my first meeting that I've been to this year. So it's, as I said, nice to get out and talk about things in person and to be reminded of how uncomfortable airline seats are. <laughs> So this is the meeting for the Swag Barlogi Salmon Myeloma Committee, which I'm sure you know because that's why you're here. And we'll give you an overview of some of the studies that have been recently completed, as well as others that are underway, and also things that we're working on, but not yet at the point that they're open, although we hope soon that they will be close to you. And also before we get going, I'll introduce the leadership because there have been some changes. I think to my left, you know, Anche Horing, who's our wonderful statistician. And we also have Rachel Sexton. Brian Dury for many years served as the vice chair and for not quite as many, but for many excellent years, we had Saad Usmani as the vice chair. And you may know that Saad is now the leader of the myeloma service at Sloan Kettering. And he had the opportunity to apply for the role of the Alliance Myeloma Chair. And I'm sure it was a very competitive field, but he hit it out of the park. Uh, sorry to make a baseball reference, I guess, in a town where baseball is not yet going. I don't know when is opening day here? Has opening day happened already? Maybe it has. Mm -hmm. Soon. Okay, thank you. Anyway, so he is now the Alliance Chair. And as a result, we have two new vice chairs who are among the most active folks in the SWOG myeloma community here. And all the way on the right is Sikander Ilawadi from the Mayo Jacksonville, whose main interests are myeloma and also Waldenstrom. And then to my immediate right is Christine Yee from University of Michigan, who's focused on myeloma. So we have a fuller table up here and they'll be able to provide great leadership and mentorship and clean up all of my mistakes that I make along the way. Scientific leadership is here. We've got Brian Walker for translational medicine, Chelsea Pinnix for radiation, we do have a few changes that we'll need to make, including identifying somebody for surgery and a replacement for SOD for imaging. And if you know of good candidates for some of these positions, please reach out to me or any of the vice chairs here or Anche. We'd be happy to strengthen our team by having folks with these areas of expertise who also have an interest in and knowledge of myeloma. And then these are our designates and we'll move on to enrollment. One of the really exciting things over the last couple of years is that the committee and the group as a whole has been very active. So you can see that myeloma has moved up on the list in terms of total enrollments. And we're now number three in terms of the treatment committees behind GU and lymphoma. And hopefully over the next couple of years, those numbers will maintain or perhaps even expand. But I did want to thank all of you because without you and others like you, these numbers would not be improving. And I think we've got some really great questions that we're asking, which hopefully will make a difference for myeloma patients. And this is a more colorful view of that. It's in the SWOG materials that are available online, but you can see that after good activity for a few years. We've really picked it up recently and we've got almost 400 enrollments for the 2021 year. Most of that comes from the maintenance post-transplant study and you'll hear a little bit about that later. The exciting thing here, first of all, this is by the way, a study that is still open and we still have several hundred people to enroll. So for those of you that are looking for a study that you can open. This would certainly be a top one on the list. 
you may remember, and you'll see this later, that there are two randomizations here. The first one is to lenalidomide versus len plus daratumumab as maintenance initially. And then after two years, based on MRD, they get randomized either to stop or to continue if they're MRD negative. And if they're MRD positive, then they just continue. And you can see at the bottom that we've got the first group of patients who have gotten to the two-year endpoint. And so we're getting people that have been randomized. You can see two of them have been randomized to stop and two have been randomized to continue. And so the study is moving forward very nicely. We've also had good enrollment to some of the NCTN studies that SWOG is closely involved with, including the smoldering trial. And Dr. Elizabeth Manisank, who's in the audience, is the SWOG champion for that. And there also is good accrual to the Equate study. And Dr. Gowan is the lead for that. She wasn't able to make it here, but I'm sure is quite busy at home. So here's our agenda, and as always, we'll start with recently closed studies, and I'll just try to give you an update on some of the recent publications within the last year or two that have come out about previous studies, and I won't go into a lot of detail because I'm sure most of you have read these or at least seen these data. But one of the updates came from the SWOG SO777 study, which looked at LEN and DEX as an induction versus bortezomib LEN and DEX. And this was the most recent update, as I mentioned, published now two years ago that looked at longer term follow up on this study. And you probably remember that the three drug regimen had a better complete response rate and also a very good partial response rate or better that was improved compared to the two drugs. And the same was true for the overall response rate. Most importantly, progression-free survival in the red curve for the triplet was better and also progression-free survival at six months in a landmark analysis. If you had a partial response or better, you did better than stable disease and VGPR did even better. Duration of response was better for the triplet, and overall survival was better. You may remember that the VRD was only given for the first eight cycles, and after that, both arms had RD only, and so even a relatively brief course of bortezomib is of benefit in terms of PFS and OS, and this was really the phase three study that established this triplet as the standard of care in induction. And this was true whether you were more mature or less mature, shall we say. There were some second cancers here, but the numbers were relatively low and not different across the two arms. So at least from a bortezomib perspective, we know that proteasome inhibitors generally do not have any concern in that regard. Now, S1304 was a study that Dr. Ilawadi led, so maybe I will pass the remote over to him and he can regale you with some of the highlights of that study, at least as I've selected them out for the slide set. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Bob. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hybrid session. So 1304 was a phase two randomized study comparing two different doses of carfilzomib with DEX for patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. Uh, of a, it was a wide participation, and uh, Dr. Abidi and Suzanne Lynch were my study co-chairs for that. So the way the design was, the patients were randomized. This, this has already been presented and actually published, but uh, low dose was the 27 milligram per meter square and high dose was the 56 milligram per meter square. And the patient still had biweekly treatment. Um, and then if after 12 cycles, uh, so the treatment stopped at 12 cycles. If the patients progressed on the low dose, they would actually cross over to the high dose arm. And this primary paper was published now um, a couple of years ago, a little less than two years ago. And what we noticed was that there was not a very significant difference with respect to the primary endpoint, which was PFS. But uh, when we look at the uh, VGPR rates, which was uh, VGPR, so depth of response, ARM2, which was the higher dose carfilzomib, fared a bit better. 
But when we look at the primary endpoint, progression-free survival, there was not a statistically significant difference. When we uh, looked at the various subgroups by prior lines of therapy, one to three or four to six prior lines of therapy, still there was not a statistically significant difference. It did seem that there was a trend towards the high dose carfilzomib arm, but it did not reach a statistical significance. Patients were allowed to have had prior bortezomib therapy. So we again did some uh, subgroup analyses of patients who were either refractory or not refractory to bortezomib. And again, in that setting, we did not find a statistically significant difference. There were some um, differences noted numerically, but again, the numbers were relatively small. Overall survival, again, not any statistically significant difference. We did look at overall survival by prior lines of therapy, again, comparing high dose and low dose with either the patient's one to three lines or four to six lines, uh, did not see any statistically significant difference there either. Uh, overall survival by prior bortezomib treatment, again, similar. There were some, like I said, numerical differences but the numbers are relatively small. And so uh, nothing that emerged as a clear data. And then 1211, I'm gonna hand back to Bob. And for those of you that see myeloma patients, I think the main disclaimer here is that this trial was designed with the then approved FDA regimen, which was to only give the carfilzomib for 12 months and then stop, which is what we followed. And of course, if you treat to progression, the results probably, which is what we tend to do now, the results probably would have been different. So don't necessarily take these data as a rationale to not continue therapy or to not use the high dose. And I think I can just add that, although we didn't, um, it was not the primary endpoint from a safety standpoint, there was a signal favoring the um, there was a slight amount of difference that came out, but again, it's important to remember this was biweekly dosing. So the dosing was also different than how we use now uh, instead of once a week. Very good. We also had the S1211 study, which Saad Usmani, who, as I mentioned, is now over at the Alliance led, and this was the high risk newly diagnosed myeloma patient induction trial and Sikander was involved with that as well, as were Anche and Rachel, of course, on all of these studies. And this was an attempt to try to determine whether adding a monoclonal antibody to RVD induction would prove of benefit. And we had gone at that time with elotuzumab. So you can see that both induction and maintenance were RVD in the control arm and then RVD with ELO in the induction and maintenance arms. Patients could have stem cells collected, but transplant was not used. The feeling was that for high-risk patients, stem cell transplant was not of great benefit with the data that were available at that time. And so there was a publication in Lancet Hematology last year of these data with Saad as the first author. You probably know that, unfortunately, elotuzumab did not show a benefit in terms of progression-free survival. And after we had presented these data, they also presented data of their company-sponsored study in newly diagnosed patients, which looked at Lendex versus Lendex elo. And oddly enough, even though it's a really great combination in the relapsed setting, in newly diagnosed patients that did not meet the statistical endpoints and so was considered a negative study. So somehow this drug seems not to be the ideal agent to use for newly diagnosed patients. And here you can see the overall survival. While there was maybe a little bit of a trend for the ELO-containing group, this study was designed with the notion that uh, again, going back to our baseball analogy that we would hit a home run. And so we went after an aggressive hazard ratio. So this was not powered to show a small difference as perhaps the overall survival data suggested. But there is an abstract at ASCO with the updated overall survival data 
And I do believe that there will be a manuscript submitted soon with Saad leading the way on that to update those data. Although if I recall correctly, Anche, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the overall survival data remain not significantly different. Very good. We do have this ECOG study, which was lenalidomide versus observation for asymptomatic smoldering myeloma. I have a couple of slides on this at the plenary session that I was asked by Chuck to give today. And this was based in part on data that were obtained from a SWOG observational study led at that time by Marav Dodapkar and Bart Barlogi that showed that PDL1 expression was linked to progression risk. And one of the many things that lenalidomide does is reduce expression of that checkpoint protein. And so this was led by Sagar Lonial at ECOG and Madov from the SWOG perspective. You probably remember this was observation versus lenalidomide. And this recently got published as a randomized trial here. And you may remember that the partial response rate with lenalidomide was 40%. Now this was just len, no dexamethasone, no bortezomib. Hence the numbers are a little bit lower than you're used to seeing in the myeloma space, but there was a better progression free survival for the lenalidomide arm, which is here in blue compared with the observation arm in red. This essentially shows the opposite. You have a greater risk of progression if you're on observation. And this was true across a lot of the relevant subgroups. Also in high-risk patients, the progression-free survival was better. Although if you looked at intermediate risk and then also low risk, although the numbers were small, the trends were not quite as obvious. So this definitely supports high-risk treatment with lenalidomide potentially, although you could argue that maybe not in intermediate or low risk. I think the other argument against treatment is this slide right here, which shows you at least within the follow-up period that was available, no difference in the overall survival. Next is the endurance study, which was led by the ECOG folks and was asking the question of induction therapy for standard risk, whereas the earlier SWOG trial asked about high-risk patients. And this was led by Shaji Kumar with Jeffrey Zonder as our lead. The schema is shown here. This was a randomization between VRD or bortezomib lendex and KRD or carfilzomib lendex. And then both arms got either lenalidomide maintenance for progression or just for 24 cycles or two years. So this also was recently published and you probably know the results, which were a little bit surprising, i.e. that the response rate for KRD was virtually identical to that for VRD. Maybe a few more complete responses and very good partial responses, but overall a similar response rate. And so that was reflected in the PFS curves here, which of course don't look very different. And within the limits of the follow-up, the overall survival curves were also pretty overlapping, although the median value hadn't yet been achieved. And we don't yet know the follow-up data from that second randomization, which was LEN for two years versus LEN to progression. Another recently completed study was the isatuximab or anti-CD38 antibody trial for relapsed or refractory AL amyloidosis. And Terry Parker from Yale led this effort. These are some of the slides that she provided in the past about this. One of the, I think, nice things about almost all of these SWOG studies is that they all accrued faster than we had expected. And I think is again a testament. So thank you to all of you for your enthusiasm on these studies. The objectives here were to look at the hematologic response rate and also ultimately, of course, the organ response rate. 
And so isatuximab was given according to the standard schedule, which was weekly for the first month, and then every other week subsequently for a two-year period. There was an abstract presented of this a couple of years ago that showed that the overall response rate from a hematologic response perspective was 77%, which is pretty darn good. And Terry's getting the data ready to put together for an abstract and ultimately a manuscript. We are still waiting on the organ responses. And as you know, it takes a little bit longer, unfortunately, for these amyloid patients to have organ responses versus their hematologic responses, but definitely an active drug, as is daratumumab, which is the other anti-CD38 that we currently have. Okay, on to the currently enrolling studies. And the main one here is the maintenance study of LEN versus LENDARA that I mentioned. And maybe I'll pass the baton over to Sikander to talk about this trial, if that's okay. So you don't have to hear me droning on for the whole meeting. Um, I don't think we have anybody joining remotely that can present. Sure. So um, as Bob mentioned, this has been actually a very fast accruing and a, and a, a very important study. So again, a phase three study of um, dartumumab plus lenalidomide or lenalidomide as a maintenance for post auto transplant in patients with myeloma. And it is actually importantly using MRD uh, directed therapy duration. So patients after registration would get randomized to either LEN or LENDARA for, main, uh, for uh, maintenance. MRD assessment would be ongoing and those who are MRD positive will continue on their assigned regimen, but those who are MRD negative could, uh, would get through a second randomization of either continuing the maintenance or actually stopping it. So I think the way this study uh, was designed, I, I really appreciate because a lot of these factors are actually not just practice informing, but potentially practice changing, um, which uh, is, which has been actually something that the committee has worked on a lot is taking advice from our patient advocates, from the community partners, from SWOG sites to help design the studies as we move on. So this, um, data uh, was actually, the, it's called the dramatic study. And this is the, some of the data from the study, again, led by Dr. Krishnan Amrita from um, City of Hope. This is the data that's, again, looking at the uh, presentation, talks about the same study schema with the main eligibility criteria. The first registration, which is symptomatic myeloma, the patients had symptomatic myeloma prior to induction and transplant performance status standard. And then there is a second registration eligibility at the time of the second randomization. And then there is a third, uh, sorry, a second registration actually at the time of, I believe the uh, transplant. And then the third registration is at the time of second randomization. But the patients get one is to one randomized. The plan is for 950 patients to go through that portion. Um, and whether it is single agent lenalidomide or lenalidomide plus dartumumab, the treatment schema with the doses are mentioned there. The patients keep getting the MRD uh, assessment, and that's where the second randomization happens um, if the patients have completed two years and whether they are MRD positive or negative. The primary endpoint is overall survival and will be compared between patients randomized to len versus lendec, uh, lendara. Sorry. And then there are some secondary exploratory endpoints. Also, importantly, talking about quality of life and also an economic evaluation. Accrual updates as of January 22. The goal is 1,100 patients registered, including those who are eligible and also um, some uh, allowance given for patients who may end up being ineligible. And as of January 27th, we have uh, 743 patients registered. Again, as uh, Dr. Lowski mentioned, the rate of accrual, 29 patients per month, is far exceeding what we had um, projected in the beginning at the time of study setup. So excellent uh, rate, and thanks to all the partner sites that have opened. But we, um, out of the 743 patients that were registered, 661 have been randomized to maintenance. And then some initial patients have actually 
reached the second randomization also where we had presented that there are actually four patients who have reached that point. And in January, as of January, even sites in Canada are activating. This is something we'll be noticing that we would like the studies to be done as much on a larger scale with widespread um, accruals. There have been some COVID challenges. So some amendments were brought in as uh, because of COVID. There was some, um, when in the, at the time of registration one, initiated induction therapy within 18 months of transplant. Registration two, they must have completed transplant within 270 days prior to step two. So some allowances were given there just to accommodate for COVID related challenges. Um, allowing up to eight weeks of dartumumab delay for patients on maintenance. In the original protocol, there was up to four weeks of main, uh, delay. And then uh, in maintenance, also allowing up to six months of lenalidomide maintenance before registration step two. These are important considerations because you can imagine the patient may have had the transplant and then they may not be able to come back for the visits that frequently to go to that second registration step or to the uh, next randomization, for example. MRD status, again, extremely important. This was a very, very important part of the study because this is integrated into the trial. This is what is actually determining how the patient's second randomization subsequent management would be. So 540 patients have been tested. Uh, 442 total patients were MRD enabled and uh, there were some polyclonal IDs total noted, uh, but no dominant sequences were found. And we had some discussion around this yesterday at our uh, group meeting. So uh, in some cases, the sample quantity uh, or quality was not considered sufficient either. Uh, amendments submitting in March or April, um, the HydraShift assay so that the interference of daratumumab with the SPEP results can be separately studied. And um, this, we, we have this in mind because we don't want to be doing an underestimation of patients who achieve a CR because of the dartumumab interference into the ESPA. And then the quality of life analysis we found yesterday was also that this has been submitted and is hopefully going to get activated soon so that the quality of life component can uh, start off as part of the study. So one of the pieces of discussion that was brought up yesterday, and I think it's extremely important for us to consider and also gain feedback on is that now generic lenalidomide is available. Some of us have started noticing that patients are bringing up this question that either an insurance has recommended to replace to generic, or uh, frankly, at least in my case, when I've found out it's been the patient telling, oh, by the way, I've been switched. And not something that is directed by our practices, but something that is considered important from the study standpoint because um, currently the protocol specifies Revlimid, but patients are already using the, but patients are using commercial supply. So uh, the protocol of the study is not directing whether it should be Revlimid or Lenalidomide, for example. Um, and we did discuss a little bit that there is a little bit lack of data, as we know with generic in combination with Dartumumab, to the best of our knowledge, there should not be any differences, but something very important from the study standpoint. So at least as a group, we thought it may be reasonable to send out a memo to the sites where the study is open, that if the patients do switch to generic lenalidomide, then at least a notation be made and informed back to the SWOG group so that this can be utilized later on in analysis, uh, monitoring of AEs, even down the road response assessment, et cetera, et cetera. We do not anticipate any issues, but we felt this was an important change to make or at least a memo to send out. Accrual by site, you can see obviously uh, City of Hope leading the number there. Dr. Krishnan is located there, but it, a widespread availability and participation from a lot of different sites across the country, both in academic and non-academic settings. The character, patient characteristics that have of the ones that have been enrolled so far, uh, median age, for example, the lenalidomide group is 62 years. The Lendara is again 62, quite balanced. The main idea to present this data that the randomization process and the way the study is set up is working out appropriately and the uh, two groups are very balanced. In fact, one of the things I did, at least I focus quite a bit on healthcare disparities and, and, and now that we also have DEI champions assigned to the committee, thanks to the kind of the process from SWOG, at least I was noticing that there's 13% in one arm and 16% in another arm of African Americans. That is a number that is better than what is average seen in our clinical trials. So I think we were quite 
happy seeing that um, difference. Again, uh, eight to 10% Hispanic patients. Those are, in, in my mind, quite good numbers, at least better than before. And I was informed that the study chairs are on Zoom and available, so I apologize to them for not knowing that and not including them. But Amrita Krishnan, if you're on and if you have any additional comments to make on the maintenance study, please go ahead. And again, my apologies. Thank you, Bob. And I think so, Kamda. Thank you. You did a better job than I could of presenting it. So um, I appreciate that. The one comment I wanted to make, because we get this question a lot, and I think we had a discussion last night in regards to another study about high-risk patients. So we are going to, as we're going to have a small subgroup of the study chairs that includes myself, Dr. Chowbro, who's the CTN co-chair, and Yvonne Febro, who's the alliance representative, and we are going to review all the FISH data um, for all the enrolled patients, and um, as I said, also designate high risk versus standard risk so that we should have some further data when the study finishes in regards to those, that specific subgroup. And one thing, uh, Amrita, that Anche and I were kind of whispering about is that the MRD data, if you can go back, Sikander, a couple of slides. Yeah, so you have uh, out of 442 patients here, almost 100 have either a polyclonal or an inability to get a clonal signal. So my question to her was whether we may not need to think about enlarging the study because the primary endpoint of overall survival will be okay. But if we do want to answer that second question of either stopping maintenance or continuing maintenance based on MRD, and essentially 25% of patients were not going to be able to know how to randomize, we may need to enroll more patients to be able to get that second randomization answered. And I appreciate that concern. I mean, I think what we talked about, I mean, it is out of 540 total patients. So there are about 100, right, who failed. Um, we are going to try to go back on the polyclonal ones and get more samples. So hopefully, hopefully we can bring that number down. Um, I think it speaks to the challenges of doing, you know, those in the MRD camp by um, PCR-based testing versus those who want to do it by flow, right? And the challenges of both methods um, in these large studies, because this is pretty much in keeping with the uh, rate that has been seen in other trials. And I, and, uh, I don't, I can't comment. I'll, I'll be interested to hear what Ancha says about the sample size and if there's a certain threshold where we're going to have to think about increasing it. Yeah, I think Bob had a good point about that. We will we'll need to re redo our uh, sample size calculation, though um, I just got a text from Rachel who did that. And um, if she said it was pretty overpowered for the second randomization analysis. So we'll, 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 we'll run, run the numbers, but we may be okay. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I'm reader. So thanks for clarifying that it is uh, 100 out of 540. So that does make it sound a little bit better, but that's still, uh, you know, a little under 20% of folks that are not being randomized. So I guess right. ultimately we'll, it depends we'll, we'll on have to how overpowered that's exactly it right. is. Yeah, we'll, we'll redo the sample size calculations, make sure we can answer that question. I mean, the good news. That is, that's a, yeah, no, it, it, it's so cool that we have that built in and we wanna be able to have a definitive answer at the end of the study, do, you know, and we stop treatment for MRD negative patients. I mean, the great thing is the study is enrolling so quickly, and that was even before the Canadians join, that we could add more patients and still finish sooner than we had originally anticipated. I know. So I, I think that hopefully there would be agreement from the folks at CTEP and NCI and the rest of the 
myeloma steering committee if we did need to add another, I don't know, 100 patients. I mean, at this rate, we're talking four months, right? <laughs> so that's not a, a big change to the trial. Sure. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So the next study that we were going to talk about, and that this one is Sikander study. So hmm, uh, it was Sikander study. Oh, it is Sikander study. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, this is S2005, which is a phase two study of ibrutinib rituxan with or without venetoclax in previously untreated Waldenstrom. The study actually got activated uh, last year, June of last year, but has overall had uh, uh, delayed in activation a lot of sites because of mostly COVID-related staffing challenges. The way the study was designed was that patients get randomized, newly diagnosed, and they would get either ibrutinib rituximab or ibrutinib rituxan venetoclax. And actually, um, everybody was designed to get two years of treatment. And then after two years, the uh, treatment would stop. Uh, if there was progression in the two-drug arm, then the patients were set up to cross over to the three-drug arm. Primary objective was CR rate, and secondary objectives were overall response, progression-free survival, safety of the doublet, uh, triplet, median time to best response, overall response rate, and we did work on tissue banking for correlative objectives that were being planned. I'll skip over this portion as the importance of ibrutinib rituxan that is already FDA approved, but we do not get any complete responses or deep responses with BTK inhibitors. And this is the way most of the B-cell lymphoproliferative disorder world is going that um, from a fixed duration therapy of chemoimmunotherapy to BTK inhibitors, which is ongoing treatment, but less deep responses to then potentially adding BCL2 inhibitors, getting deeper responses, and again, going towards fixed duration therapy but without including traditional cytotoxic chemo. Um, the eligibility was newly diagnosed patients, uh, good performance status, no grade three or four peripheral neuropathy, creatinine clearance above 30, and then standard markers for uh, a, uh, liver function and also uh, bone marrow function. Sorry. As I mentioned, randomization to two or three drugs, if the patients progressed on the doublet, they would cross over to the three drugs and the treatment would be given for a maximum of two years, either from the first uh, start or after the crossover. The patients would get up to two years of maximum treatment and then actually they would go to even monitoring. Uh, as I mentioned, CR rate was the primary objective. Uh, it was kind of non-existent with the root number rituxan, so uh, we calculated based off of that. And then we were talking about extramural funding for the correlatives. So what I think we uh, can go over to is then uh, some data that we've found out just literally this week, uh, which is there was a single arm phase two study being run at Dana-Farber with a combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax in newly diagnosed Waldenstrom. And earlier this week, we were made aware that there has been an adverse safety signal from that study. And so there was a new concern that there may be a uh, side effect profile, unfavorable side effect profile for this combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax in patients with Waldenstrom. Now, the data we have so far, or we have been made aware so far, is that there were four events of ventricular arrhythmias in patients with ibrutinib and venetoclax uh, in the Dana-Farber study, and um, there were actually two deaths out of those four patients. Um, I'm aware that the uh, study at Dana-Farber was modified to get more cardiac monitoring set up and to see if they could isolate where uh, these adverse events were coming from. But to the best of our knowledge, we do not have any more granular information, um, for example, cardiac amyloid, et cetera, et cetera. So the Dana-Farber study has actually been uh, terminated to the point that patients who were on treatment, their treatment was terminated and everybody has been moved to event monitoring. Now that has significant implications for our this SWOG study S2005, which my co-chair, Dr. Botani, is also here from Columbia in New York. And what we have taken a decision is because the safety data is not available, anything more than that, that we would not want 
to expose any patient to the risk of that adverse event. So as of last night, we decided to send out a clinical hold on this trial till we have more data available or have a better uh, subsequent plan. There is one patient who's currently on treatment at Sloan Kettering, and I've been in contact with the PI over there. That patient's treatment has also been held. We had just consented the second patient and a bunch of other sites were in the process of opening. But as of yesterday, like I said, that we are going to be sending out a clinical hold. We are working on regrouping with CTEP, uh, potentially gain uh, information of uh, reports that may have been submitted to FDA from Dana-Farber. We, I have been in contact with the PIs at Dana-Farber and also with the pharma sponsors of that study at Dana-Farber, as well as our study, the pharma supporters. Um, how, whether this study would be uh, modified or whether it would need a replacement, that all has to be figured out because this is relatively recent uh, information. But we are also going to ask sites to not necessarily spend any resources or effort in activating the study if they have not yet activated and if they were in the process of doing that. Because um, as I mentioned, we don't think that the study will be going forward in its exact same format. Something will change. Something will have to change sort of thing. Bob, any thoughts around that? No, I think I agree with everything that you've said. Um, we would ask that you keep this study, <clears throat> excuse me, in mind, because we do think that we're going to be able to modify it in a way to give your newly diagnosed Waldenstrom patients two safe options for treatment. I think we're all enthusiastic about the Waldenstrom space, and this is the first cooperative group study that has targeted Waldenstrom in probably at least 10 years, if not longer than that. So I do think that there is a, an unmet medical need there, both with regard to the patients as well as with regard to you and the sites. We just have to make sure that we do the best we can from a safety perspective for the patients. Sure. And if any of you have concepts for Waldenstrom that you want to propose, please reach out to us because there is a, an opportunity there with regard both to newly diagnosed and ultimately as well in the relapsed or refractory space. Absolutely. So with that, I'll uh, hand over to Christine, who's our SWOG champion for this next study. Thank you, Sikanda. Um, so uh, this uh, is uh, EAA171, uh, which is an ECOG study, uh, optimum study, uh, stands for um, optimizing prolonged treatment in myeloma using MRD assessment. And the study chair is Dr. Sashi Kuma, and the co-chair is Dr. AJ Anuka. I might have to raise Well, fortunately, the study is advancing more quickly than the slides. <laughs> yeah. um, oh. Just, oh, I thought it was just went on to pause, just like a vibrant study. <laughs> So uh, this audience, um, I don't have to uh, explain MRD um, in multiple myeloma. And um, the meta-analysis has been shown that MRD uh, negativity uh, can be translated into prolonged uh, overall survival in multiple myeloma. However, MRD status has not been used um, as an actionable item in the clinical practice. Um, meaning if MRD is positive, uh, whether or not to escalate the treatment, and if MRD is negative, whether or not to uh, de-escalate the treatment. Therefore, there is uh, a met need uh, to look into the prospective studies, how to utilize MRD results to guide therapy. So for patients um, who are transplant eligible, uh, standard of care at this time is single autologous stem cell transplant followed by lenalidomide maintenance therapy. And the median progression-free survival with this approach is approximately four years. 
Um, however, many patients continue to relapse. Therefore, um, it is unclear for us to know whether or not we can improve the clinical outcome if the patient uh, is MRD positive after one year of maintenance therapy, whether or not escalating treatment will be helpful to improve uh, their uh, clinical outcome. So this study plans to uh, enroll patients who have received um, lenalidomide after transplant for 10 to 15 months. And the transplant has been, uh, should have uh, com been completed within a year of diagnosis. Patients will go through the first uh, step, step zero uh, for pre-registration uh, with MRD testing. If MRD is negative, patient will be off the study. If MRD is positive, patient will go through step one, which is randomization to two different arms. Arm B is the stand of care arm with lenalidomide uh, and a placebo. And arm A is the study arm with um, exazomib added to lenalidomide. Patients on both arms will be treated um, until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity. Patients will be stratified uh, based on IMWG um, fish uh, risk and uh, prior lenalidomide dose 10 versus higher than 10 milligrams. Primary objective uh, for this study is to assess the overall survival improvement in patients who receive additional treatment uh, in addition to standard of care lenalidomide after one year of uh, post-transplant maintenance therapy based on MRD uh, positivity. Secondary objectives uh, include um, improvement of MRD negativity and PFS, and also to assess the quality of life if uh, patients have intensifying therapy. Additional secondary objectives include um, the assessment of the kinetics of medullary and extra medullary relapse among patients on maintenance therapy, and also explore cell-free DNA as the marker of MRD, and then compare two approaches for MRD assessment. The treatment for arm B is the stand of care lenalidomide 10 milligrams daily uh, for days one to 28 out of 28 days. And arm A is uh, to add exazomib four milligrams weekly days one, eight, 15 out of 28 day cycle. This study will um, require uh, an estimated 510 patients to be randomized to arm A and B um, and anticipate uh, to have 714 patients to have the uh, MRD testing and uh, with a 536 um, MRD positive uh, patients. The uh, disappearing, the, dis hmm. the disappearing slides are part of the stress test for new vice chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we can survive. <laughs> So um, uh, this study actually was uh, just uh, approved um, a few months ago, and uh, many sites are still uh, going through the regulatory startups, and uh, we would appreciate your active uh, participation in the study and uh, reach out to us if any questions. Please, sir, come on up. We have Dr. Stiff gonna ask a question. I should so, also so mention- how does this work with the uh, dramatic study? You, you, you can't-, you can't oh, the dramatic study, right. You yeah, so stop actually- the dramatic study and put patients on this. Yeah, so, um, so initially, actually, these two studies are designed for different patient population, uh, should not be overlapping because this one is only looking at patient MRD is positive and then um, um, intervention based on that. Um, dramatic study actually um, had, because of the COVID, um, the time window um, for post-transplant uh, starting treatment has been changed. So um, I would um, uh, imagine that the study enrollment could be affected. Um, however, 
Um, fortunately, a dramatic study enrolls very well and uh, hopefully um, that will um, be completed soon. Well, I just want to make it so that everybody understands that you put a patient on the dramatic study, you can't, you shouldn't be taking them off to put them on this study. No, that should be an in absolute ineligibility criteria. If you're on the dramatic study, you cannot enroll on this. Correct. I'm surprised CTEP approved this, but uh, um, they said they weren't going to approve any other studies while the dramatic study was still ongoing. But uh, obviously, that's not the case here. So I'm concerned that people will, I mean, these people, some of these people are MRD positive. Um, so, um, no, I think you're making an excellent point, which we yeah. can try to reinforce. I think the original thought behind this study was that it would capture people who were, for whatever reason, on standard of care, lenalidomide maintenance, and had already started in the post-transplant setting and not people that are on the dramatic trial, but we can definitely make that a larger and more obvious statement. And also I think Sikander is checking uh, to see if there are any questions in the chat area. And for those of you at home, if you have a question, please, you can also interrupt the presentation at any time verbally if you don't want to go through the chat function. No questions. Okay, very good. So next on the roster is the EQUATE trial, and I guess I'll give you just a quick update on that. And Christina Gowan from Arizona is our lead for that. And as you can see, this is a trial that is entitled Effective Quadruplet Utilization After Treatment Evaluation. And it's a randomized phase three trial for newly diagnosed myeloma patients essentially patients who are getting daratumumab with lenalidomide and dexamethasone or DRD, then get MRD testing. And based on the result, there is a further randomization to daralen dex continuation therapy with bortezomib or just continuing daralen and dex. And these numbers are way too small for me to read, so I'm going to pass on those uh, just to encourage you to be able to think about this trial for your future roster. And then the last two sections are going to be on studies that we're currently working on. There is a follow-up to the original high-risk study, which at first was S1811, and then more recently was S1911 and will need to be updated. But Brea Leip, who hopefully is online, will be the lead for this, and I'll turn it over to her. And it looks like Sikander says she is there. So Brea, take it away. You might be muted because we're not hearing you. Well, maybe we'll keep going while we work on technical difficulties. Essentially, the concept here is to add the BCMA targeted by specific teclistamab to the induction and maintenance regimens. And this is a study that is still undergoing some design. So again, there is room for input, but the current discussion has been to do RVD DARA as the control arm and RVD DARA with teclistamab as the experimental arm. And for maintenance in the control arm, there would be some combination of an imid, a proteasome inhibitor, and probably DARA. And in the maintenance arm for the experimental arm, there would be some combination of teclistamab. And we had probably a one hour discussion at the working group meeting yesterday as to exactly what that would look like. And I think we are still working through some of the options. This is a trial that hopefully we'll be able to start putting together into a capsule for internal review in the third quarter 
So you do, again, have an opportunity to opine about what you think would be the most exciting design that would get you pumped to put your patients on this if they had high risk disease. Hi, sorry, Bob, I, I had to step away to answer a page, of course, as soon as you like said my name, but sorry. Oh. Okay, let me but, turn but it back I am to here. you then. Yeah, but, but I am here. So as, as you were saying, and, and I'm so sorry, uh, but this is, again, the initial objective of this was to look at overall survival between two arms. And so we had decided to look at VRD DARA versus VRD DARA tech. And then the maintenance for this was is something that we're still looking at. So again, the secondary objectives for this trial, we were going to look at the progression-free survival between these two induction arms and then look at the response rates and look at the toxicities, obviously some quality of life analysis, and then there's some MRD analysis planned as well. So this was initially designed to be the follow-up from 1211, sort of the next iteration of looking at uh, upfront induction for these high-risk patients. And so that's what it is. But as, as Bob was saying, sort of the schema is really going to depend on what people feel comfortable with in terms of putting patients on. So a couple of things that have come up have been whether or not we still feel comfortable avoiding an upfront transplant in these high-risk patient populations, and whether we feel comfortable putting a high-risk patient on Daratec maintenance without a proteasome inhibitor or lenalidomide, given what we know about these patients and their risk. Is the RVD Daratec enough upfront during induction to justify Daratec in the maintenance setting? So that's some of the issues that are up for debate as we're designing this schema. I don't know if anybody had any comments think, or thoughts. Uh, we've got Dr. Stiff who's going to make a comment and maybe Dr. Bhutani as well. I think it's a great, a great study, a great opportunity if we can get this pulled off. I, I would say that this will accrue very quickly and so maybe think a little bit wider, maybe a second randomization so that you can assess the efficacy of the bite in induction and assess the efficacy of the bite in uh, maintenance. So you might not need it in, in uh, upfront, just put it in the maintenance. So having a, uh, a literally uh, a second randomization so that some people who might get uh, no drug for, for induction and maintenance and um, those that get the drug, uh, the bite for induction and not maintenance, uh, and not get the drug mm -hmm. and get it in maintenance and then get it in, in both uh, sides. I would say that you throw the kitchen sink at this and I would say that transplant should be allowed. I don't think it necessarily should be mandated um, uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, these are high risk patients. And I think, again, uh, the goal is to try to really improve their outcome. Uh, these drugs are very exciting and very efficacious. And uh, I'm, I'm, I would put every patient I could find on this trial, but I, and I do think it will accrue quickly. And so that you should think as big as possible. So sort of trying to answer the question that came out of the Cassiopeia trial, which was whether you need DARA in both induction and maintenance would be your suggestion. I, I like that uh, notion. Dr. Bhutani, how, what is the Columbia I view that, on this? I study? I, my question is, you know, why are we using overall survival rather than PFS? Because with the number of treatments available afterwards, those treatments are going to have an effect on the overall survival as well. Well, I think we definitely collect PFS, but historically, when we've discussed these studies with CTEP, their goal was to use overall survival as the endpoint. Uh, but yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and we'd certainly be open to continuing to have that discussion with them. So we will have follow-up calls. And if any of you are interested in being part of that, please reach out to us because again, we wanna cast a wide net and make sure that we come up with maybe not the study that makes everybody happy, but as we talked about yesterday, the study that makes people least unhappy. There's actually a... There's actually a question on the chat. Uh, so 
Deborah Beattie is asking that for the EAA181, which is equate, uh, the quadruplet um, study. Yep. So the uh, for the EAA181, physicians are not excited about consenting them for this protocol prior to a bone marrow, as many of them do not have a diagnosis yet nor are they excited about repeating a bone marrow if they do indeed meet requirements. Now, I did text uh, Christina Gowen, who's the SWOG champion, and she's actually on hospital service rounding, so she can join in to answer that question. I think that's a reasonable question. I... Do we know anything about the enrollment to this yeah. study, which is being led by ECOG? Because I think if the enrollment is slow, that would be an important piece of feedback to bring to them. So it, the stuff that Christina just sent me says that uh, 498 sites are approved. Actually screening is 109 patients. So accrual target is 1450, 1450, and 100 and 109 patients have been screened and 67 have actually uh, gone on to intervention so far. I, and study was activated in October of 2020. Okay. Hi, well, Sikander, that... Patrick Hagan here, sorry, I'm virtual. I just, would, just wanted to chime in real quick because I was on a recent ECOG call talking about the amyloid study concept and this very question was raised and Vince and Raj Kumar was, they were kind of pretty adamant that this wasn't going to be a huge barrier, but this has come up multiple times. So I know that they have at least heard this concern, but their the conversations on that call were along the lines of that they probably aren't going to change this. Just uh, a little additional info. Yeah, that does not sound like an encouraging enrollment rate for what sounds like the first 18 months so far. So unless there are modifications that can be made to help that out. I guess the thought is that the patient, the, the, the concern that the patient would have a bone marrow biopsy, make the diagnosis, could potentially get less than one cycle of treatment. And then if they get registered, they need that a bone marrow biopsy again for the baseline for MRD. And that's when they go on to the trial um, and eventually get. So I think that's the concern. Yep. We can, we, we can, Kind of reach out and provide feedback that this was brought up in SWOG as well, because uh, if they've heard, um, and I think uh, what Deborah is sending as a follow-up uh, thought is that there is no pre-screening consent as other trials have, that some trials have a pre-screening consent to potentially be able to capture some of the information or some of the stuff that the patient may undergo anyways, but this trial does not have that. So those are important feedback that we can convey back to the ECOG group. Uh, Cause if they've heard similar things from ECOG themselves and now if they hear from SWOG that may make them at least think about these issues and, and try to address them. I mean, just thinking out loud, I wonder whether the mass spec based MRD testing for peripheral blood couldn't be used instead because that would obviate the concern about people having a, an initial diagnostic biopsy before they even get to the study and then having to have a second one and then having to have a third one, even though the sensitivity of the assay is probably not quite the same as the clonaseq. And this was actually, we just came off our uh, three-site Mayo uh, retreat, uh, myeloma retreat, uh, just about a week or so ago. And this was brought up and uh, not just specifically in the context of this particular trial, but in general of mass spec based testing to be able to apply towards the clinical trials. And what I understood was that there is a little bit of gap still or a little bit of time before which the assay will reach to the point that it could be widely applicable to such large studies like a, a thousand plus patient study. But this was brought up as an alternative so quote-unquote like a liquid biopsy concept kind of concept although it is commercially available already i think the the thing that was brought up was that it is commercially available but just like mrd had some issues with the reimbursement in the beginning that some individuals mentioned that they have had issues with reimbursement and 
I don't know if that was the reason to bring up that it was not being required by the study, because what if some people are able to get it, some not? Yeah. Well, I think it would be nice to try to salvage this because we all want to be able to use MRD in our decision making and a study like this would definitely inform, at least in this setting, whether that is appropriate or not. But thank you for that comment and we'll try to get that feedback to ECOG, although it sounds like maybe they're already aware of that. I think we all know how much effort it takes to get a study like this up and running through the cooperative groups. So I think we should all be motivated to try to do what we can to salvage it. Okay, so studies that are in the works and are moving through, we'll turn it over to, it sounds like Patrick Hagen is on the line to talk about his AL amyloidosis study looking at transplant yay or nay. So take it away, Patrick. Thank you. I, I think these may be older slides, Bob, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, oh, apologies. Next, it's okay, we'll go to the next and make it work. We can go to the next slide though, just so I can see where we're at. Um, yeah, so this, these are some older slides, but it's okay. We can hit the highlights anyway. So this is a study um, that's been in development for about a year and a half, looking at the role of high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant and systemic like chain amyloidosis. So I'm, I'm Patrick Hagan from Loyola, for those of you who don't know me. And this has really been a group effort with a lot of support through um, SWOG, but also um, kind of consistent communication with some of the other cooperative groups in the BMTC-10, because amyloid is a, a rare disease. So to do any kind of national study, we need a lot of buy-in and cooperation, which thankfully we've gotten. Um, so really the big question kind of highlighted here in the background here is really what is the ongoing role of, of high-dose chemotherapy in the current era with a lot of new drugs that have been developed? So there's really only been one study ever that's looked at this in a randomized fashion. And this was the old study published back in the New England Journal in 2007. Well, this is really outdated and flawed because um, they experienced really high transplant-related mortality, 24% on that study. And transplant was actually inferior, but really what we know now is that in experienced centers, so if you're doing at least three or four transplants a year, that TRM is really consistently lower more in the two to 5% range. And there's even some single center um, experiences that don't do a lot of amyloid. And if, if patients are selected carefully, the TRM now is, is, is quite low and acceptable. We also know that induction therapy before transplant, as well as the actual dose of melphalan, so whether you get full dose or dose reduced, really are the two biggest factors driving good outcomes um, for transplant eligible amyloid patients. Um, and I think one of the big reasons, and I keep harping on this, why this is really a critical question is because we really don't know what to do with these patients. And that's really um, depicted on the practice patterns that are very different in the US compared to Europe. In the US, kind of the estimates are tough because who's really transplant eligible and who gets screened, et cetera. But maybe as much as about a third of patients will undergo transplant um, after their AL diagnosis. And a recent really large alchemy study out of the United Kingdom showed that it's really quite lower there. And that's more consistent across Europe. That study showed only about 3%, so a tenfold drop. So we know that these studies have been tough to enroll on, but the recently accrued Andromeda study, which is really established now, the now FDA approved regimen of Cyberdidera as kind of the go-to upfront regimen enrolled very quickly. And that was quite a large study. And as, as Bob and our group highlighted, we recently accrued um, the uh, isotuximab study in the relapse refractory setting quite quick. So we think there's an appetite to, uh, to look at this question and potentially answer it. Um, so go to the next slide. So important in terms of feasibility, again, there's some updates here, but we're, we're doing about 300 transplants annually and that holds up, holds up for 2020 and it's holding up for 2021. So that the more recent two years are really critical as Cyborg DARA or DARA VCD has become more of a standard with pretty good outcomes. So we think in terms of feasibility, things look good. We're not doing less transplants, we're collect selectively bringing the right patients to transplant. And I, I think that is important in terms of potential enrollment. Next slide. So, so again, this is a study that we're hypothesizing. So we're, it's gonna be a randomized phase three study. And the primary outcome of the study is gonna be what's called a modified progression free survival, which is a combination of uh, hematological progression, 
death or organ progressions in AL patients. So unlike um, myeloma and amyloidosis, organ progression is the key driver of toxicity, morbidity, and even mortality, as, long, uh, as well as a hematological progression. So these are all really important endpoints in any study on AL. And this was an endpoint, this composite endpoint was really established by the Andromeda study, but it's being increasingly re reported in the literature and accepted as an important endpoint in amyloidosis. Furthermore, survival endpoints in amyloid are prohib prohibitively long. And even hematological progression can be quite challenged to, to follow. So we'll, we'll look at a lot of uh, important secondary endpoints, uh, such as quality of life, overall survival, treatment-related mortality, so both on the transplant and non-transplant arm, um, obviously organ response, hematological response, including MRD, and then hematological PFS. Next slide. So this is the basic study schema. So patients are enrolled based on eligibility, um, and there are strict eligibility that I'll highlight hopefully in the next slide, but um, all patients will, after they're registered will undergo two cycles of DARA, BCD, or DARA cyborg induction as standard. And if they're deemed still transplant eligible based on, um, uh, again, strict eligibility guidelines, they'll be randomized either to complete an additional four cycles of DARA, BCD, or go on to high dose milk and chemotherapy and transplant. So this is a one-to-one -one randomization. So basically we're really trying to isolate the role of consolidation here. Is ongoing DARA BCD superior or inferior to high-dose chemotherapy and transplant? We're not mandating stem cell collection, although we'll encourage it. That has a lot to do with kind of practice patterns as well as uh, financial reimbursement issues. And then all patients will go on to complete 18 months of DARA med maintenance. Again, in the DARA BCD arms, this will be kind of standard as for the Andromeda in the high dose chemotherapy and transplant arm, those patients will pick up post-transplant with monthly daratumumab to complete a total of 18 months. Uh, go to the, so that's the study schema. So again, there, there's a lot more detail ahead in the other slides, but essentially the, the inclusion criteria will really be heavily dictated on transplant eligibility. Um, actually, IHA and the ISA just re, uh, recently reported some updated transplant guidelines, which is essentially what we'll be following, and I, I certainly can provide that to anybody who's more interested. Um, patients have to also achieve at least a partial response to their induction. So if someone's getting DARA VCD, for example, and has stable disease, that's not somebody who we want to just get four more cycles of the same treatment to. So those patients would come off but followed on a registration basis only. Um, they can have symptomatic myeloma. There's some other, again, the uh, important exclusion criteria that I won't dive into here. Um, they have to be able to collect enough stem cells for transplant, et cetera. Um, but these are the, the highlighted ones. Uh, next slide. So this, is, this has changed uh, in more recent. So essentially, um, these numbers are, are in the ballpark, but essentially what we're doing, this is gonna be a randomized phase three study. It's gonna need to, um, in, enroll uh, 139 patients to actual their registered treatment arm. We're gonna have to account for some dropout obviously because there's again, gonna be a few patients who aren't gonna be able to achieve a PR. And with amyloidosis, we're gonna expect to lose about 10% patients um, due to toxicities and other issues. So this is a little bit more of a challenging patient population than myeloma. There's, always, there's a little bit more um, expected toxicity from therapy. But essentially, um, ultimately, we're looking at 139 patients um, per arm, so a total of 278 um, randomized, plus uh, some additional patients, obviously, that will be lost um, for a variety of reasons, again, both due to response and toxicity. Uh, next slide. So we can go to the next slide, because these, these numbers aren't right. Okay, go back. So, so essentially, sorry. So there's that's this is the idea. Again, I can these slides are a little old, but I can provide any um, updated information to anybody who has questions. Um, but you know, one of the issues we've had in talking with statistics is, you know, we really we wanted this to be a randomized phase three trial. We want this to be uh, to potentially answer this question in the most definitive way. Um, the way the study is currently designed is that we're looking to see. Uh, looking to see an improved in the, this modified progression-free survival in the transplant arm that is actually depicted here, 30 up to 46 months. So the study is designed um, looking at transplant superiority over the DARA BCD. Um, so the, there's been, again, because this is a rare disease, there's been a lot of cooperation and buy-in from the other cooperative groups as well as the BMTCTN. The study has uh, made its way through SWOG and in the coming you know, one to two months will be presented both for 
form approval by the BMT CTN with endorsement as well as the NCI steering committee. So the study is kind of getting off the ground here and hopefully we'll start to move quickly. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and answer any questions anybody might have. And I apologize for the, some of these numbers being off. Yeah, sorry, my bad. I did find your slides that were updated that you had sent me and I didn't incorporate them into this morning's presentation. So it's that's okay. my fault. We can fault. maybe just go back to the schema back a few slides just so people can look at that. And if anybody has questions, I can answer them because that's that's the heart of the study. Yeah. Or do my best to answer them, I suppose. No questions from the home audience, Sikander? Hi, hi, Patrick. This is Putani from uh, Colombia. It's uh, would you allow a patient who has maybe received one or two doses of cyber D data before? Because that's becomes an issue by the time the patient comes to us. They are somebody sometimes already started on treatment. Yeah, this has come up several times. And as we you know, obviously we still have to get into writing the formal protocol. Right now, we're not where one of the exclusions is previous therapy. I think this is gonna be something we're gonna to have to really discuss. I would be a little bit hesitant allowing someone a full cycle, but potentially some minimal treatment to calm disease um, might be necessary based on how our enrollment is going. So it's a great question. Right, right now, how we have it designed is no, but it, that's something that we may need to continue to look at and consider. Uh, Patrick, this is Sikander. So this is a question we have now addressed a few times in some trials. So first of, I think the first trial to my memory where uh, this was addressed was SOD's uh, 1211 high-risk study. Again, a similar concern that a patient with high risk may start treatment in the community already if they are referred um, or if they need urgent start. So less than one cycle or up to one, sorry, up to one cycle was allowed in that study. Then as we'll probably come to our um, uh, frail um, elderly concept, we are allowing some uh, less than one or up to one cycle, as long as it does not contain daratumumab. So I think there is merit in thinking about what can be done because you don't want this um, relatively rare condition, the patients don't get enrolled. So think of how it may impact your study. And if it doesn't impact your study, your overall plan, and if Dara VCD is supposed to be given anyways, then maybe you can consider one cycle of treatment, and you could even consider building in a stratification of who got pretreatment versus not, which would help you isolate your own impact versus theirs. And if especially there is any quality of life uh, information built in there, then you will have to take that pretreatment into account because some patients may have either a worsening or improvement in their quality of life when they get registered if they've had some treatment before. But the PRO committee has been very helpful in trying to help us figure out how to isolate this thing as there is a way they feel statistically it is doable. So I would actually support the wise thought that, that it's reasonable to consider you don't want patients to get excluded because of this pretreatment issue. Yeah, and I, again, I, I actually, I generally agree. I think um, it would have to be, obviously, we'd have to very carefully um, kind of dictate what pretreatment would be allowed and it would definitely have to be um, accounted for in terms of a stratification. And I don't, I don't know if Anchi and Adam would chime in. There's currently three stratifications built in. Um, the Mayo stage response to, to pretreatment um, and the intent to use full dose melphalan or not. So if we added a potential for stratification, you know, would we be, would we need to increase enrollment at all? Because again, the enrollment is a little higher than I'd like already um, for a rare disease, but that's how it's currently designed at least. Yeah, I think that was a good discussion. I would certainly support if somebody's had one cycle of Dara Cyborg D that they could be enrolled. I think the question is, do you count that as one of the two cycles or do you give another two cycles? And I guess my initial knee-jerk reaction would be that if they got a reasonable facsimile of DARA VCD, that that should be counted as one of the two cycles. And uh, people sometimes present, and it is the only FDA approved regimen. So you've got that going for you. Yeah. I'm not sure about including other 
regimens that might get a little bit too sticky and you may get too much inhomogeneity in the patients. But I agree if they've had Dara VCD or they're in the middle of the first cycle, I think it's pretty reasonable to include them. Yeah, I do. It would have to be incorporated and counted in my opinion, just because, you know, median time to even CR in this regimen is less than two months. So it's, we get pretty rapid um, uh, disease reductions with this regimen. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely open to it. And it's something we definitely should continue to discuss as we start the protocol writing here in the coming months. And Patrick, you could consider going back to the language that we typically use in phase one trials, that if a patient has received more than 70% of the intended treatment for that cycle, then that may be considered the appropriate full cycle for if the patient has received more than that, that should be counted as the first cycle. So I think, I think reasonable questions reasonable to kind of try to figure out how to capture this. Again, the intent being that we would like these rare disorders to be captured as much as possible and patients don't become ineligible, which is also another um, effort, I guess, from the DEI champion to help guide a lot of this uh, with, again, the idea that patients should get more and more option or uh, opportunity to get onto clinical trials. And I think it's really safe because, again, I didn't highlight this, but in this study, there's going to be two eligibility checklists. There's going to be one both at diagnosis and then pre-randomization. So, so again, if there was anything kind of bringing in maybe a patient who was borderline or had a little bit of treatment, hopefully in terms of the safety and, you know, the clean randomization that should be addressed at the second eligibility pre-consolidation where we're doing the randomization. There is another question in the chat coming, which is actually going back to S1803. So um, I think that somehow came in a little bit later, but in S1803, the question was, um, again, yeah, so, um, so Jody is asking that S1803 question prior to step two registration is the bone marrow collection for MRD. This is difficult at community sites as the post transplant bone marrow biopsy is done at the transplant center. To obtain the need to, uh, to need the marrow for step two sometimes requires the patient to have an extra bone marrow biopsy and insurance companies are not paying for that extra one. So again, considering that uh, the patient may get the initial bone marrow biopsy in the community, the transplant biopsy is done at the center and sometimes uh, there's an extra one built in there which reimbursement may be an issue. So I'm assuming that that's because sometimes the transplant center does not have the trial open or they may not realize that the patient is on the study and may not be sending the sample. Is that correct? I, I'm understanding that the, because that would require a baseline MRD sample to be sent for future analyses, that if that MRD sample was not sent at a bone marrow, then a separate aspirate would at least be needed to send the MRD testing and insurance may not always approve that. I think her question is more linked with the bone marrow collection for MRD is difficult in the community sites. So this is the baseline bone marrow, not the baseline. one around the transplant or two-year out point. Yeah. Correct. That the community sites are uh, uh, not sending that sometimes because the current workflow is that the bone marrow around that time is supposed to be done at the transplant center only. So sometimes that community site doing the MRD testing or sending out the MRD testing, they're thinking is getting a little bit challenging or is a bit challenging. So we can provide that feedback maybe to Amrita to try and address. Or Amrita, are you still on? Yep, I'm still on. So oh. your question is in terms of the, you're right, because that, that since we allow registration before or after transplant, I mean, it's a wide window, right? And most of the patients come to the transplant center after four cycles. We never, I mean, our own newly diagnosed patients, sure, but given the dropout between induction and going to transplant, I don't think we can, you, you can't capture all those baseline samples. So, so the registration is basically um, after the transplant, and that's when the randomization is getting done to LEN or LENDARA. Correct. 
I mean, you can register before, but at least operationally, for example, at our center, we found it's just easier to register with them after. And I suspect that's what most centers have done too. Yeah, and I, there were discussions. Oh, sorry, go ahead. This is, sorry, this is Hannah. Um, I just wanted to point out that in the most recent version of the protocol, we amended the eligibility criteria to say patients must be willing to submit the MRD samples. Um, it's my understanding that at the, at the registration step two sample, it's not quite as dire as say the 24 month sample, as long as we've got the patient's archival samples from initial diagnosis, we can still process that 24 month sample, which is what we use for the step three registration and second randomization. I don't know if that helps anyone. So, so I think, Hannah, that does help that if the archival sample can be utilized in any way, shape, or form, that is something which we should be able to clarify to the sites, since at least if uh, Jody's concern is that they may be under the impression that they have to do another marrow and that marrow may not be reimbursed, so there comes a dilemma. So hopefully our accruals can even be further better. But it does actually say, and Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, it says archival sample in the calendar too. I mean, we're pretty. Okay. Yeah. So the archival, we, we require the archival sample. However, we do, we also say that a lack of an archival sample is not exclusionary. So for the patients that do not have the archival samples available, we consider them MRD positive. Okay. So that's actually quite helpful. So maybe what I can suggest is, as uh, Jody sent out this message, uh, a call out to all the sites that if they have, it can be a little bit confusing. When is registration? When is MRD? When is baseline? When is randomization, et cetera? But if anybody has any question and they are trying to take a decision about whether the patient fits the criteria or not, I would strongly urge to please reach out to the study chairs they are here or to the SWOG center. And this is where the troubleshooting can happen because maybe there is a patient who we think may not be eligible or we may have the window, but they do still fall under the window. Because sometimes the protocols have gone through amendments, different amendments have been applied, et cetera, et cetera. When I recall there was a lot of discussion when the study was being put together about when registration should occur. Mm. And there were some people who wanted it prior to the maintenance. Other people wanted it earlier. And unfortunately, this is one of those examples where no matter what you pick, there are going to be some people who are not 100% happy, I would say the fact that the study is enrolling well uh, is at least certainly testament to the fact that it's designed currently while perhaps not making everybody happy is nonetheless one that captures a lot of patients and hopefully we'll be able to answer the questions that are being asked. But thank you for that comment. And we'll continue forward here. Dr. Bhutani, do you want to regale us with your proposal for this amyloid study? And I'll pass the baton over for you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Olaski. So this is the study that we are currently developing. Is uh, uh, It's a double-blind randomized uh, uh, phase two trial of CAL-101 versus placebo in patients with the renal AL amyloid. So just to level, give a little bit of background, uh, you know, <clears throat> even though, you know, we are making a lot of advances, the uh, outcome of patients with the AL amyloidosis, especially advanced cardiac disease, continues to be very poor. And on the left side, you can see some data from Mayo Clinic. And over time, you know, these are three different time periods. And it's, this is a survival of patients who are non-transplant eligible. Although there has been improvement, but the survival of these patients remains even, uh, you know, pretty bad with the two or overall survival of only 47% in the most recent time period. On the right side, you see that the patients who do get a hematologic response, you know, which is getting better, obviously, with the newer therapies, they tend to have significant lack time period uh, lag uh, to get an organ response and the median time from hematologic response to organ response is more than 10 months. So clearly there is a lot of room of improvement there in terms of what we can do to improve their organ responses. So this is the question we are asking, you know, with 
can we improve these outcomes, especially the organ responses in patients who, uh, with the use of an anti-amyloid antibody? So as you guys uh, are all aware that there have been, you know, past work to address this. And one of the first antibody that was used in this uh, setting was NEOD001. And a pronto trial that took patients who have been previously treated with a plasma cell therapy, randomized the patients to NEOD001 versus placebo. Unfortunately, did not meet its primary endpoint, which was the cardiac response. But uh, there, there was a significant difference in uh, renal response in those patients, almost a 20% improvement uh, although that was not the primary endpoint of the study. Uh, there was a second trial that was started at uh, uh, Tufts by Dr. Comenzo that uh, primarily took patients with persistent renal dysfunction. That trial did not complete enrollment. There were only 11 patients that were enrolled. And at that time, the company decided to sort of, you know, not proceed with it. But they had the six patients, <clears throat> two out of six patients uh, had uh, actually renal response who had kidney involvement. And one patient actually had a drop in uh, proteinuria from 17 grams to 4.9 grams after three months on being on this drug. So there was clearly a signal that maybe, you know, the drug can elucidate, you know, renal responses in some patients. So the antibody that we are interested in is it uh, KEL-101. This was the antibody that was developed at uh, uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, and the antibody works uh, uh, by... Uh, attaching itself to uh, a light chain at this site, which is a loop flip that happens when uh, amyloidogenic protein deposits in the tissue. So the antibody binds uh, to only the deposited tissue, uh, uh, to the amyloid protein in the organs, not, not in the blood. So uh, this is where the antibody binds. And previous work has shown that uh, uh, you can give this antibody and uh, a binding uh, to patients that have the biopsy proven organ involvement ha has been shown. And in this particular example, the patient had involvement of liver as well as a bone marrow. And you can see once they were given the radio labeled antibody, the antibody was able to bind to those sites. And we were able to then show by biopsy that the antibody can be picked up in the organ. So based on these data, you know, we completed a phase one uh, trial at uh, Columbia in patients who were uh, previously treated, uh, uh, and some patients were relapsed refractory AL amyloid. Uh, those patients had to have some persistent organ dysfunction. Uh, they were treated uh, uh, in two, there was phase 1A and phase 1B. In the phase 1A, the patients only received a single dose, and in phase 1B received a total of four doses uh, in a dose escalation fashion. We recently published the data in blood, and we did show that the antibody was able to elucidate, you know, cardiac responses in about more than 60% of the patients, and we saw about 50% renal response rate as well. Based on those data, there are currently two ongoing uh, phase three trials that the company is doing in cardiac patients. Uh, given that the cardiac uh, studies are ongoing, we are focusing in this study primarily on the renal patients. These were the data that was presented at ASH. There is another phase two trial that was being done at uh, a Cleveland Clinic, and they had uh, uh, seven patients that were enrolled with the renal dysfunction, and all of those patients had, uh, you know, uh, achieved a, actually a renal response. So it does seem to be a, a, a signal there as well. The drug was, you know, very, very safe, and this is the data from our phase one trial. Uh, practically no real sort of, you know, high-grade toxicity was seen. So this is our uh, study design. Uh, patients with the history of renal AL amyloid will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to KEL 101 uh, versus placebo in a double-blind randomized fashion. Um, so the primary objective is going to be the renal response rate in patients uh, treated with the, with the drug. And the second, secondary objective are going to be uh, cardiac response, uh, organ progression-free survival, uh, overall survival, safety, <clears throat> as well as patient reported outcomes. These are going to be the main eligibility criteria. So patients should have, uh, you know, renal involvement uh, by presence of a proteinuria, uh, as well as a previous history of a biopsy proven amyloid that could be biopsy proven from anywhere. They don't necessarily have to have a kidney biopsy. Uh, the proteinuria has to be more than one gram at the time of uh, uh, enrollment in the study. 
they should have received primary uh, previous anti-plasma cell directed uh, treatment and at least achieved a complete remission or a very good partial remission. Uh, we will allow patients up to two lines of prior anti-plasma cell directed therapy so that you know we don't run into enrollment issues. And we had quite a bit of discussion, you know, how to sort of uh, uh, we are allowing patients up to four years uh, from the time of starting the first line treatment, just so that we have sort of enough numbers <clears throat> to be enrolled. We didn't want to and you know increase this too much because you know as the time goes on the chances of them achieving a, you know organ response goes down and down so we will limit that at four years uh, patients should have completed their last dose of uh, uh, anti-plasma cell therapy at least uh, 16 weeks uh, and for those patients who are getting a transplant the transplant must be at least 24 weeks prior to them getting enrolled on the study we will let given the andromeda data we will let the patients continue the maintenance therapy with the CD38 antibody uh, as per the uh, discretion of the treating physician. We will exclude patients with advanced uh, heart disease, those which uh, NYHA class uh, three or four heart failure, anti-pro BNP more than 8,500 or an ejection fraction of less than 40%. Uh, anybody who has multiple myeloma and Poem syndrome will obviously be excluded, and anybody who has previously used an anti amyloid antibody will be excluded as well. This is the treatment schema. This will be a double blind randomized phase two trial with one to one randomization between KL101 and placebo. Uh, KL101 may be given at a, you know, the MTD, which has already been established at one gram per meter square. Uh, given weekly during cycle one and then every two weeks for a total of one year. <clears throat> uh, and there will be additional two-year follow-up. Uh, and the primary endpoints we have already discussed is the, going to be a renal response rate. Uh, we are allowing a crossover. Uh, this was a, you know brought up in our previous studies, given that this is a placebo-controlled trial. Sometimes the patients are not really that interested sort of in the study. So just to sort of, you know, tell the patients that, you know, if they have an organ progression, <clears throat> uh, we will allow the crossover. So the two things, one is a patient who have hematologic progression, we will let them continue on the study, but we will allow reinitiation of anti-plasma cell therapy as per the treating physician. And the patient who have evidence of organ progression will be unblinded. And those who are on placebo arm could be then crossed over to the KL-1 arm. One arm. For those patients, they should have received at least two months of study therapy prior to the crossover. And we will sort of require another testing to confirm the organ progression uh, after four weeks of the initial testing. Once they cross over, they will receive another one year of therapy with KL-1 arm. <coughs> so we have uh, run the numbers. And Jay and, uh, helped a lot and Adam helped a lot with running the numbers. So uh, our sort of, uh, sort of uh, the hypothesis is that the patients on the placebo arm will also continue to have a renal response because, you know, as you guys know, once you achieve a hematologic remission, there is a lag between uh, getting the organ response. So our sort of hypothesis about 30% response rate will be there on patients in the placebo arm and our drug will improve that to about 50%. So based on that, we calculated the numbers and we need about 63 patients with the drop off rate. We need about 70 patients on each arm. And this is the sort of the accrual number we're looking just through SWOG. But I think if we enroll ECOG and Alliance, I think we can definitely improve the accrual. Uh, these numbers are uh, on the table on the left side, you see 2.5, 3.5 and 4.5. I think in our recently completed isotuximab study, I think we hit about three patients uh, per month. So based on that, you know, uh, we calculated uh, the time that we will require uh, for uh, enrollment. Uh, <clears throat> so hopefully we can, you know, better these number by uh, involving ECOG as well as Alliance. Uh, and uh, there will be a stratification by a history of transplant as well as uh, a DFLC of less than one. We are also thinking of adding a stratification factor of uh, a renal uh, stage. We're planning to do an interim fatality analysis given the previous you know, data with NEOD001 that wasn't really that effective. So after 50% of patients have been treated for six months, uh, we will perform this analysis to see uh, if there is a signal of the activity. 
So this is where we are. I'm happy to take any questions or suggestions. Thank you, Dr. Batani Aman Badara from University of Utah. One question there. So if patients have a hematologic progression on the trial and they go for a transplant in that setting, will they have to come off the trial? Oh, well, that's a good question, which we haven't thought about. <laughs> I think if they're going for transplant, most likely they will have to come off the trial. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Are there questions in the chat? Yes, I think uh, some stuff did come. Um, so I think Hannah uh, sent some um, updates to everybody in the chat. So uh, regarding 1803, so I think that'll be helpful. Um, I also addressed Jody's question directly with her. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Hannah, for doing that because it seems that Jody was picking up some information she thought was discrepant in two different places in the protocol, so may have caused some confusion. So thanks, Hannah, for handling that. And there's a question uh, coming regarding uh, Devaya's presentation about what was the degree of renal responses, measures of improvement of quality of life, patient reported outcomes. So I think the degree of renal responses, I think you uh, probably referring to the phase one study that we completed. Uh, we had some patients, you know, who had fairly significant proteinuria and we saw, you know, 50 to 60% decrease in proteinuria in some of the patients. And similarly, uh, the Cleveland Clinic has reported the same sort of similar impressive renal responses in some of their patients in their phase two trial. Uh, in terms of the uh, quality of life and PRO, there is quite a bit of data published by Dr. Anita D'Souza from uh, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. So we are going to use her work as sort of our uh, uh, quality of life and uh, patient reported outcomes uh, uh, as guide to uh, guide to this. So we are still in, in process of developing that. Yeah. All right, very good, thank you. Thanks. And we'll move on to one more presentation and I'll turn it over actually to Dr. Ailawadi and Dr. Yi because they're leading this effort. So one of you take it or hand off. So I'm to... actually gonna let uh, Christine take through the initial portion then I'll add some stuff later. All right, um, on behalf of the study team, um... I'll be talking about this phase three randomized uh, trial for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients who are considered to be frail and intermediate frail patient, uh, intermediate fit patients, not eligible for transplant. And we will compare two frontline regimens, VRD light versus DRD, followed by maintenance therapy, uh, Revlimid plus minus deratumumab. So we have two primary uh, objectives. Uh, one is to maybe I can just move on to the schema to make it easier for you to, um, mm -hmm. to look at. So we will enroll patients uh, frail and intermediate fit um, per definition from the protocol in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients, randomization into three different arms. Arm one, um, starting with induction therapy, VRD, followed by Revlimid for maintenance therapy, and this is the VRD light. So um, the dosing um, schedule is different from the standard VRD. Uh, this is uh, based on Dr. Nupur's um, publication for frail patients, uh, which is uh, one of the most commonly used frontline therapy in frail patient population. For arm two, uh, start with induction therapy, deratumumab, and Revlimid, and dexamethasone, followed by the same maintenance therapy, which is Revlimid. And arm three is to start with uh, DRD as the induction therapy, however, adding deratumumab to maintenance therapy. So we have uh, two primary objectives. Uh, one is to compare the PFS uh, in arm one versus arm two. Uh, which is to compare two different induction therapy. And for the second um, primary uh, objective is to compare the overall survival 
uh, sorry about the typo, uh, it should be the ARM1 versus ARM3, which is induction followed by maintenance therapy to compare the entire regimen. And uh, major secondary uh, objectives uh, included to compare a PFS in ARM1 versus three and uh, to compare OS uh, in ARM1 versus ARM2. And also we will compare the other um, overall uh, response rate um, and uh, safety data, um, as well as to describe the uh, medium time to response um, uh, all three study arms. So uh, in this uh, patient population, uh, we're trying to uh, look into the patient population from the real world. Um, and certainly we have unmet need in this patient population who are usually not eligible for any clinical trials. It could be uh, they are very elderly with um, uh, less optimal performance status and also comorbidities. And RVD light, as mentioned, is one of the most commonly used regimen. And DARA or, uh, RD has been approved by FDA based on my uh, trial data. So the hypothesis is to see whether or not DARA RD induction therapy followed by DARA plus uh, Revlimid maintenance therapy offer longer PFS uh, in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma compared with um, RVD light followed by the Revlimid maintenance therapy. And also we would like to look at um, the overall survival comparing these two um, regimens. Um, I will not go, uh, go through all the eligibility criteria. However, we do have this myeloma frailty uh, index uh, to be used for calculating the myeloma uh, frailty score. And based on this patient will have um, the classification of either frail versus intermediate uh, fit patient um, groups. And then uh, we do have uh, these um, inclusion criteria so that this study will not overlap with um, the ECOG study uh, for a similar, the equate uh, uh, study patient population. So for this um, study with two um, objectives. Now we have two um, primary endpoints, and this is to compare the PFS and also um, OS as mentioned earlier. So um, we do have the um, risk stratification. Actually, this has been updated. We will uh, be looking at uh, one is the um, frailty score, um, and the second is to go by the FISH uh, result for high versus standard risks. And then number three is the prior uh, lenalidomide uh, dosage. And we're planning to enroll about 507 patients and to account for the 10% eligibility rate, we will have additional uh, patients enrolled for a total of 564 patients. And again, randomization will be one to one to one. We will also have the interim analysis built in. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Andre would have any additional comments uh, in this regard. For stats portion, any, do you have any additional comments? No. Okay. No, you explained that very nicely. Okay, great. Um, All right. So a couple of things that I did want to point out, like Christine mentioned, where our hope is to have the study set up as close to real world practice as possible, because these are FDA approved available regimens. Uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria have been made so that we are able to capture more patients rather than them being excluded. Um, there are some additional things that, and I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get the slides in time, but um, there are some additional objectives that we have worked on. So for example, patient reported quality of life, which will be captured based on QLQC30 and also pro CTCAE criteria of fatigue, peripheral neuropathy and pain. These are being actually built into the study now. So they will activate with the study, uh, the quality of life measures. Uh, Dr. Christina Gowan, who's the uh, QOL lead has been actively involved with the pre arrow committee. 
We are working on tissue banking at, at three different time points, baseline, end of induction, after one year of maintenance, and then the translation medicine plan is being worked on. There is a health economics component, which will talk about uh, healthcare utilization. And we're trying to see if there may be a component of financial toxicity and cost effectiveness that can be built in, but that will for sure be a post activation amendment, but we're working on it. Uh, MRD assessment will be done. Like Christine mentioned, that's an extremely important question that has not been addressed in this population before. So MRD assessment is being built in and that will be used, uh, performed using standard of care testing. And then there is a possibility of sub-study that we're looking at for thromboprophylaxis on the sidelines of this as a sub-study, but that will also be a post-activation amendment. Uh, I do want to point out again the efforts from having a DEI champion in the uh, committee. So uh, Dr. Espinoza has been helpful in helping set up a minority accrual plan. And our hope is that on the sidelines of this particular trial, we can set up a very formal minority accrual plan and somehow figure out a way of holding ourselves responsible for it. So, so far what we have done is um, that we've made it made the study relatively more user-friendly. The inclusion criteria have been made more lax. So for example, a patient could go on if they had an ANC between 0.75 and one. Typically patients have to have an ANC above one. If there's an elderly patient above the age of 75, they could get into the trial irrespective of kidney function. If there is a younger patient and they meet certain uh, frailty score, uh, the creatinine clearance has been a requirement has been dropped. Again, the, to, to be able to have more patients eligible. Uh, we're hoping that it would be intergroup. Uh, the study is already has an ECOGN Alliance champion and we're hoping, Christine's been working extremely hard on getting it set up at VA where we already have a champion assigned and hopefully also through Canadian partners. And what more we can do, we've been trying to um, discuss with our patient advocate to set up an external advisory group for minority accrual. We are also trying to identify sites that could potentially enroll more racial ethnic minority patients. And then it will set up a very specific communication and dissemination plan to advertise or talk about the study. And actually, uh, Dr. Espinoza and I have been talking about maybe setting up a um, Again, like I said, a formal plan to how to maximize that. We don't have that ready yet, but we have at least a framework we are working on. Any thoughts, any questions, comments? Uh, Sikhana Samrita, I had a, just two questions. I put them in the chat and I think this is a really important study because this is what we always struggle with in, in our elderly patients. Uh, my two questions were the relative dose intensity of Revlimid in both arms is going to be different, I think. And is there going to be a way to account for that? And then my second question, just to, I'm glad you're looking at high risk as well. And just if you could expand on your definition of high risk, especially in regards to 1Q uh, gain and 1Q amplification. So Amrita, thanks a lot for bringing those questions. So first of all, the Revlimid is actually the same intensity as Christine mentioned. The, so I'll just mention that the VRD light we have selected for this was very helpful feedback from the SWOG group and uh, during these previous meetings because it's a slight modification from Nooper's trial, but is the VRD light that is most commonly used. So actually the Revlimid intensity and the cycle durations have been made equal in both arms. And we got approval from CTIP regarding that. But excellent question, because there may be confusion there. And as far as the fish is concerned, I think the thought was to use the standard guideline that, for example, has been used for 12.11 as well. And we've talked about um, 414, 1416, 1420, 17P, and 1Q. Christine uh, or Bob, any thoughts that maybe we were planning not to include these? Uh, I think in the, one of the previous meetings, we've said that yes, 1Q amplification would also be included in the high-risk definition. So all these five would go in. But thanks a lot for that question. We initially uh, went by IMWG criteria. Sure. Um, well, hopefully they can update their criteria and include the 1Q. <laughs> we can go with the Mayo criteria, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if you planned, is there a role for serial uh, frailty assessment? As you can easily imagine, some of these uh, older and frail people kind of unraveling more or less and maybe recovering and maybe not on different arms. 
I think uh, so. The question is that uh, potentially doing the frailty assessment serially in patients. I think that's actually. Uh, I think that's built into the different time points for assessment. Yeah, so as part of the PRO. Yeah. And the quality. So some of that is built into the quality of life, but I think um, I will probably go back and check and look into this again and, and talk to Christina also because if we are formally not doing the frailty score, but we are capturing some of the QL components. I think having a serial frailty score assessment at those given time points of the quality of life actually would be a very, very good, uh, because that way we'll be able to find out exactly what we're wanting to find out, what are the drugs doing to the patient? Are they actually improving or could the side effects be overpowering? Excellent idea. I think I'll go back and look at the protocol. And, and it's cheap. The calculator is already ready. Somebody's got to do it. We can just, from our SWOG side, just make sure that the forms at that QOL component time point are capturing an updated frailty score also. Excellent question. All right, very good. I think that was all that we wanted to cover. And I want to thank all of you in person as well as who are present virtually. Many years we've not had enough to talk about to fill two hours and now we have more than enough to fill. So that's exciting and it's great to see everybody engaged and involved and keep in mind again that there are other areas that are open for study proposals. So if you have ideas, please reach out to any of us and we can set up calls offline to polish up proposals and get them ready. And we do have a monthly call as well that all of the committee members are welcome to dial into. So thanks very much. Enjoy Seattle and the rest of your Friday and your weekend. And we'll see you in the fall.